So thank you very much for the opportunity to give some commentary on this uh, great presentation. I totally agree with uh, Mr. Saburi that uh, the presentation was fantastic. So it's an extremely yeah, thorough and uh, comprehensive um, uh, summary of economic issues facing the aging and shrinking Japan. Gives a very clear, you know, visualization of the big picture of the problem that we are facing. But at the same time, uh, the argument is supported by the wealth of the macro, uh, the aggregate, and then also the micro data at the individual household level and the firm's level, which I really like. And uh, it also uh, provided a rich uh, cross-country analysis so that we can, you know, clearly see where we stand relative to uh, peers in the OECD countries. And, uh, you know, based on these uh, data analysis, uh, Dr. Jones gave a comprehensive strategy and a policy recommendation ranging over, you know, many aspects of the economy. And uh, th th it's, it's definitely, you know, goes beyond the uh, my, my capacity to discuss everything that he presented, but um, the main two of the main issues are include uh, the, this uh, inevitable decline in the population. So in order to you know mitigate the consequence of that, we have to either increase the labor force or increase the productivity of the scarce labor force. And then we also face the rising age-related expenditures coming from the public pension, health, and long-term care. And then we need to implement the effective fiscal policies to stabilize the rising burden. So here uh, for the next. Uh, eight, nine minutes, I'm going to, um, since I'm a macroeconomist, I'm going to take a micro-founded macroeconomic approach to um, reiterate and then also corroborate the two of the main points that was discussed that were discussed by the Dr. Jones. And the one issue is about the labor shortage and then also the roles of the uh, female uh, labor force participation. And the second one is about the labor market dualism, which leads to the inequality across people and then also uh, future fiscal challenges. So the first one is about the uh, women in the labor force. So as Dr. Jones emphasized, we are not doing so badly in terms of the labor force participation of women. As you can see in the picture on the left, the labor force participation rate of women is lower than men, but compared to the OECD average, we are not doing so badly. But if you look at the uh, picture on the right, uh, the average earnings of women is extremely low. What's really problematic is that we don't really see an increase in the wages. So women, although they stay in the labor force, they do not accumulate the human capital, which we can see from the increase in the data that we see in the male wage profile. So the questions are naturally, why do women work and also the earn uh, the way they do as we see in the data? And then we also want to understand if we can do anything about that uh, uh, using the policies. So what are the roles of the fiscal policies? So let me just briefly uh, talk about the, you know, the study uh, that I worked with my co-author, Minamo Mikoshiba, which is also published as the Realities Discussion Paper. So what we did in this paper was to build a life cycle model, which is typically used in the macroeconomic studies, and then to examine you know, women's uh, labor market participation pattern so that uh, we can uh, generate uh, you know, the, what uh, we see in the data and then try to uh, simulate the policy reform so that we can understand the effects of the uh, policies. So in doing so, we focus on uh, the women born in the 1960s, which who are now uh, in their 50s, so that we can track you know, what they have done over their life cycle. And then we're going to focus on the effects of the three policies, uh, spousal reductions, and also the social insurance tax exemption, and the survivor's pension benefits. So all these policies were introduced and implemented uh, from a good intention. So women, you know, back in 1960s or 70s, it was the norm that they stay at home and then men go outside and work. But the women, since because women have very low income or no income, you know, the government wanted to help. So these are supposed to be, you know, helping and support low income or non-working dependent spouses, but they're not doing something that they were meant to uh, do in the past. So here's the picture of the labor force participation of women by age. So as you can see, there's this uh, V-shaped profile. So there's a decline in the labor force participation in the 30s when you know women have kids and uh, get married. But then after that, the participation rate starts to rise. But if you look at the composition, as Dr. Jones emphasized, there's a, a clear uh, pattern that you can see. So there's a big decline in the regular employment. But at the same time, there's an increase in the contingent or the non-regular jobs. So what happens, what's behind this uh, you know, V-shaped uh, uh, participation profile is that uh, the, there's a decline in the regular jobs. And then when women come back to the labor force, they come back not as the regular worker, but as a contingent worker. And then if you see that uh, this uh, you know, distribution by the marital status, you can see the, clearly the different pattern. So on the left, I have a picture of the you know, labor force uh, uh, employment type. 
uh, for single women. So you can see that the share of the regular work is not changing that much. But when you know women become married, you're going to move from the left picture to the right picture. They're going to switch from the regular job to either not in labor force, the one in the black line, uh, or also uh, the contingent work. And what's the problem with that? The wage is very different. So the blue uh, represents the wage profile of the regular worker. I'm also distinguishing between the high type and the low type based on the education. So high represents uh, women with a college degree or more, and then the low uh, includes women uh, with less than college degree. So as you can see, there's a wage inequality, but inequality is not between the educational skills as you know is typical in the US or other countries, but the inequality is more between the regular work and the contingent work. So what's really problematic is that uh, if you stay in the contingent jobs, which you know uh, include most of the women after they get married, uh, they, they don't really see the growth in their earnings. And then uh, what are the roles of the fiscal policies? So as I mentioned, you know Japan has a very uh, comprehensive social insurance system, which costs a lot. So we pay about 30% of earnings shared equally by employer and employee. But if you're dependent to spouses earning less than the threshold of 1.3 million yen, you're going to be exempted from all the social insurance tax payment. And then there's also the pension benefits, survivor's pension benefits. So you can also claim, you know, this is the husband's pension, part of the pension, uh, if you're not, uh, you know, contributing enough to the system. And then the labor income tax in Japan is individual based, but there's also spousal deductions. So if your wife is not working at all, then the husband can claim this uh, deduction. And uh, that deduction is going to disappear as your uh, wife's uh, income will increase. Okay. So this, uh, you know, spousal deduction is standing as the barrier for the entry because women, if you know, women start to work, then the household is going to lose this exemption, and then this exemption of social insurance taxes are also standing as the wall against the, uh, you know, increasing uh, 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 earnings for women because once you cut, you know, go over this threshold, then the tax liability of the household is going to um, increase dramatically. So we uh, try to um, understand the effect of these policies using a life cycle model. And what we did, um, you know, if we add this blue line is the you know, baseline coming from the data and then also from the model. And uh, if we remove this uh, spousal deductions, what happens is that there will be an increase in the participation rate. But that increase is going to mostly come from the rise of the contingent or the non regular work. This is, um, you know, the entry cost, but uh, they, they, more women start to work, but they don't want to work too much because there's another wall standing ahead of them, which is this uh, exemption of the social insurance taxes. So if we remove this, uh, you know, so-called uh, tax sanjumai no kabe, or the wall of the 1.3 million yen uh, threshold, what happens is that there will be an increase in the participation, and then that increase is going to mostly come from the rise of the regular work. Right. So there's no more uh, uh, a wall standing ahead of them. So they're going to start to participate more and then accumulate human capital as the regular worker. So that contributes to the rise in the earnings as well. So if we remove all these policies, what would have happened? So this is a hypothetical experiment that we did in the model. But by removing all these three policies, employment rate could have increased by uh, 12 percentage points. And moreover, the earnings would have been higher by about 30 percent. So that's the big increase in the productivity. And then uh, the second point is about the labor market dualism that Dr. Um, uh, Jones emphasized. So it's not just about the women, but also the share of uh, non regular work among men has been increasing as well, that you can see on the picture uh, on, the, on the right, right? The share of the non regular workers among men increased from less than 10% uh, back in the 1980s to more than 20%. So as a consequence of this, uh, what happens is that there has been a big increase in the inequality of earnings among the young households. So this picture shows the um, change in the earnings genie. So this is the index that represents the inequality of earnings. And then we computed that by age group. So as you can see, uh, there's an increase in the earnings genie among uh, you know, young households. That partly comes from the increase in the non regular work. And then what's the problem with that? At the same time, it's not just about the earnings. They don't have enough earnings, so they are not able to accumulate more wealth. So this picture shows households who reported that they don't have any wealth. And uh, this share also increased from about 5% to 10%. 
So that's also a big uh, problem. And uh, most likely these people are not contributing well enough to the social security system as well. So maybe in 10 years, 20 years, this distribution is going to shift to the right and they reach the retirement age. By that time, they don't have enough saving and the social security claims. So the government will not only have to provide, you know, the pension, uh, health insurance, long term care, but also the social assistance expenditures are expected to rise. So it's not that, um, you know, we can wait for long, but we have to do something about this uh, very quickly. So just to wrap up, um, there are many outstanding issues associated with the shrinking and the aging population. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Jones laid out a comprehensive strategy, and I totally agree on the problems identified and the suggested policies. But uh, at the same time, there are many policies, you know, that we have uh, that have not changed over the last uh, few decades, which may have worked quite well back in 1970s or 80s, but they don't really fit well um, in the current situation. And as Dr. Jones emphasized, it's not simply the policies, but also the, you know, the convention seniority system or the social norms mm -hmm. that probably need to be re-examined and must change. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kitao, uh, with a very limited time. I'm sorry. And, uh, um, uh, we will now move on to the question. Uh, sorry, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, no, the, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. That was excellent, and I really like your charts. I think next time I revise my book, I'll put these <laughs> charts in my book. So <laughs> it's very well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, we would like to the, move on the question and answer, answer session. We have only five minutes, so and uh, we have the uh, three uh, questions from the audience. So uh, I would like to the, uh, pick up all together. Uh, the first question is uh, China. Uh, what would happen to China when its post population starts uh, declining in a uh, similar way to Japan? This first question. And the second question the uh, SME is how have uh, political policies uh, in other OECD countries be able to stay in power while letting SME uh, having voting power in the elections exposed to uh, market competition. And the last one is that uh, uh, ja labor productivity. Uh, Japan's, Japan's labor productivity is low among OECD, uh, but it does not, uh, does not reflect the high quality uh, that comes with products proceed in Japan. Do you? Uh, have the, uh, do you agree with this? So may I ask you to answer? Or, or to on the last question, I certainly agree. I really appreciate in Japan <laughs> when I go uh, buy something or the quality of services is very high. Mm -hmm. And I think um, with the labor shortages we've had, I've had Japanese friends complaining that the quality of services has gone down. But coming from my country, I still find the quality extremely high. And I think uh, Japan should be very, very proud of that. On the question about uh, SMEs, um, I think in most countries, SMEs, maybe not most countries, but in the US, for example, SMEs are viewed not as a old declining sector, but it's the, the uh, vitality, the Silicon Valley and the startups. And so I think the goal for Japan is to, uh, to move away from SMEs being the, the backward part of the economy to being the driving part of the economy. And if you look at the age of the, the uh, entrepreneurs or the owners of SMEs, uh, by 2025, Meti said that uh, I think that 70% will be um, over age 70. So that means they won't have much longer in business. So mm -hmm. I think we need to think about uh, the consolidation of existing SMEs to make them become bigger and more um, efficient. And then trying to encourage uh, the startups and the uh, venture business that would make a uh, more dynamic economy. I think. Uh, I read a figure the other day that um, when you ask new college graduates what are they looking for, high wages, uh, an interesting career, or stability, the share uh, choosing stability was the highest. And so I think people are risk averse, especially in Japan. And if you're looking for stability, being an entrepreneur is not the way to go. <laughs> but I think that would be uh, something very important to drive the economy forward. And the final question was on, on Japan, uh, China uh, having their population. Um, China, of course, uh, had the first decline in population uh, in 2022, the first time since 1960 during the Great Leap Forward. So uh, China's entering a new stage. They don't have nearly as well-developed safety net as Japan does. And so I would be less worried about the fiscal side, but more worried about the elderly poverty 
how they're going to cope with increasing poverty among the elderly. And with a one-child policy, the burden on children will be extremely heavy. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be hard for a child, that means in a couple, each one will be the only child for elderly parents who might need help. So it's gonna put a huge burden on the working age population mm -hmm. as this goes along. So I, I'm quite concerned about the Chinese situation. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Dr. Tao, uh, do you have any final comments of this? Uh, no, no, that's okay. fine. Um, about the China, I mean, uh, what, what the, what's going to happen in China will have a consequence on the, our economy as well. I mean, as Dr. Jones mentioned, they don't have a you know very uh, uh, generous uh, social insurance system, so they, their saving rate is extremely high. And then if uh, you know the retire um, the uh, you know the longevity keeps increasing and the number of kids do not respond to the change in the policy, they will keep saving. Probably the interest rate will go down, maybe well below that of Japan, and then they may start uh, investing in Japan. So you know what they want to do about the policy and the demographic changes will have some consequences uh, on the Japanese economy as well through the change in the capital flows. So that's something that we should keep an eye on. Okay, I thank you, Dr. Kitao. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm. that, uh, you are the American that uh, you uh, posted in the Paris, uh, so you know the uh, American and the Western uh, mm -hmm. countries, and uh, you cover the uh, Korea and Japan, so the mm -hmm. you are the real the <laughs> cosmopolitan and uh, global, uh, uh, you're showing the uh, mm -hmm. global point of view. And uh, uh, today I uh, learned from a lot of uh, about Japan, and it, it sounds like for me that uh, uh, I'm listening to the uh, home doctors, the uh, explanation. So the, uh, I'd like to the, uh, know more about my body, Japan, <laughs> from you. <Europe. laughs> and uh, uh, the, try to the, uh, take your the recommendations. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, please keep in touch oh, to you. Japan and the uh, Thank you so much. And uh, actually, one, po one more point that uh, 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 with the, your uh, lecture that uh, uh, we have one hope. Uh, Japanese sound like the, uh, the four engine jet without mm -hmm. igniting three engines. Mm -hmm. uh, other OECD countries have the four mm -hmm. uh, engines mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, now, uh, very powerful. And uh, Japan has four engines, but uh, only the uh, men, older men, and young men. Old mm -hmm. men, it's working, <laughs> but a uh, little tired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the Young power and the, uh, women's power is not mm -hmm. the uh, uh, utilized. So the, yeah. uh, we have, we're still the frying, <laughs> but so we, if we ignite the right. other three uh, engines, right. we can go. Yeah. I, I should just conclude saying I'm, yeah. I'm very optimistic about Japan. Oh. I mean, I, I, sound, I find the problems and try to make recommendations, but seeing Japan's great history, I'm confident that Japan will uh, be able to make the good choices and it'll continue to be a, an outstanding, uh, unique country in the world. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, we'd like to be a good student. Okay, <laughs> um, we'd like to the, uh, conclude the, today's seminar. Uh, thank you very much. And today's video and presentation materials will be posted on the WETI uh, website at a later date. Thank you very much for your participation in our BBL webinar today. <laughs>